Uh, good evening. My name is Catherine Weinrob, and on behalf of the Alexandria Historical Society and our co-sponsor, the Office of Historic Alexandria, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's lecture, A Jewish History of Old Town Alexandria. For those of you who do not know, May is the Jewish American Heritage Month. While the efforts to create a Jewish heritage, excuse me, a Jewish American Heritage Month had been in the works since 1980, it was not until April 20th, 2006, when President George W. Bush decreed that May was dedicated to recognizing and honoring Jewish contributions and achievements. Um, again, those who heard me, those who didn't, just a reminder that we'll take questions after the lecture. And now on to our speaker, Mark Livingston, a computer scientist by profession, has been a volunteer tour guide for the Lillian and Albert Small Capital Jewish Museum which was formerly the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Washington since 2004. And he's helped author the walking tour that the Capitol Jewish Museum um, of Jewish Old Town Alexandria and has led that tour since its inception. He resided in Alexandria from 2001 through 2016. And without further ado, ado please welcome Mr. Livingston. All right. Thank you, Catherine. On behalf of the Capitol Jewish Museum, our thanks for inviting us to be with you tonight, even if we ultimately had to settle for a virtual presentation. I'm going to present selected material from what is normally a walking tour, of course, and uh, hopefully you'll be familiar enough with Old Town to visualize some of the locations we'll talk about. And we'll try to use some maps and pictures as we go as well. I'll start with the beginnings of the Jewish community in Alexandria. Uh, we know that by 1855, the large German immigration includes many Jews, and some find a home in the German community of Alexandria. Uh, the community seems to have grown quite quickly at the beginning. Uh, the Civil War sees already a few hundred Jews living in Alexandria. This is accompanied by the founding of multiple Jewish institutions. The Hebrew Benevolent Society and the Associated Home of Peace Cemetery was founded in 1857 as the first communal Jewish institution, and I've listed a few others here on the bottom of the slide that followed. But the period from Reconstruction through the end of the 19th century sees a significant decline in the Jewish community, and some of the institutions did not last, again, as you see at the bottom. Uh, but let's focus on the institution that is central to many Jewish communities, and that's the synagogue. Bethel Hebrew Congregation was founded in 1859, and it's interesting in that it was founded as what we would today call a reform congregation, although the denominational name probably wasn't applied until the 1870s. Uh, at the time, actually, there were two congregations founded in Alexandria. The second was Orthodox, but it was very small, and we don't even know its name. Uh, before the Jewish New Year in September of 1860, that second congregation merged with Bethel. Uh, services for Bethel were held in rent spaces, locations mostly along King Street, uh, such as Stewart's Hall, until 1871, when, according to Bethel's history, an influx of Jewish families meant a need for more space. The highlight of this year was the construction of a permanent home on this lot you see pictured here in 1871. Uh, that year also saw the sermons begin to be delivered in English, which is a major step towards Americanizing the services. Hebrew and German were still used in the services until 1882, when German was eliminated completely. I mentioned the decline of the, of the community in the late 19th century. Membership in Bethel dwindled to as low as 11 members, although that's perhaps family members. Uh, and so Bethel was forced to uh, no longer be able to keep a rabbi on staff, but had to have lay leadership. Uh, so, for example, uh, the president of the congregation, Isaac Eichberg, is listed as having being as being the leader of services at uh, sometime in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, rabbis from Washington Hebrew Congregation in D.C. were brought in for special occasions, and students from Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary in Cincinnati, were hired for the Jewish High Holidays. This situation continued until 1939, when Bethel hired Rabbi Dr. Hugo Schiff from Karlsruhe, Germany. 
Rabbi Schiff had been imprisoned in the Nazi concentration camp Dachau. The congregation worked to hire Schiff and get him a visa to the United States, getting him out of Dachau. Unfortunately, all that is left of this building is a memorial plaque at the site. Post-World War II, the Jewish community grew again, and Bethel needed a larger space. Uh, they would, again, rent out neighboring churches for a high holiday service for a time, but in 1957, they moved to their current location on Seminary Road. Now, large numbers of immigrants coming from Eastern Europe to the United States in general, including to Alexandria, from approximately 1880 to 1920 also included many Jews, uh, just as the German immigration had decades earlier. In 1914, these Eastern European Jews formed their own synagogue called Agudas Achim. Uh, like Bethel had done years earlier, they first held services in members' homes. Uh, they were Orthodox at that time, uh, and they did not agree with the ritual practices of Bethel or its home of peace cemetery. In 1927, they purchased this large Italianate house on the corner of Pitt and Wool Streets to serve as their synagogue. And although, be although it began life as an Orthodox congregation, Agudis would soon affiliate with the conservative movement in 1945 while they were still in this building. Uh, they moved to Russell Road in 1947 and then in 1958 to their present location on Valley Drive in the northwest part of Alexandria. Unfortunately, the building you see here was demolished in 1961. It does appear to share some of the architectural features with its surviving neighbor, that's the Val Smith House you can see in the background of the picture, uh, and it certainly would have made for an ornate synagogue and perhaps indicates that the community was doing pretty well if they could manage to rent such a nice building. So those are the two major Jewish institutions. I'm gonna turn our attention now to the individuals who made up these communities. Uh, the early German Jewish community often opened stores that stayed in families for two or three generations. As early as during the Civil War, Jewish businesses were numerous along King Street. German families were often sellers of dry goods and clothing, including Solomon and Wolf Mayenberg, brothers who had a store you can see here at the far left of the picture opposite the famous Marshall House Hotel. Uh, later, Eastern European Jews would expand into other fields. Many of these stores were examples of the stereotypical mom and pop type of store. Uh, to give you a sense of how uh, many Jewish businesses there were, here's a quote from the Alexandria Gazette in September of 1863, just a couple of days after Yom Kippur. It says, the extent of business done in this place by citizens of Jewish denomination could be seen in a glance this morning by the appearance of King Street and the number of closed doors on that thoroughfare. So obviously it was pretty well known that several of the businesses in town were owned by Jews. And there's usually a notice around that time every year for a few years during the Civil War period. And sometimes they would explicitly mention the fast. So we were pretty sure they're talking about Yom Kippur. It gives you a sense of how common it was for Jews to own businesses that were known to be Jewish in Alexandria. Now, some of these Jewish-owned businesses grew to be much larger than mom and pop operations. Uh, this building, then and now at the northwest corner of King and St. Asa Streets, once looked like this. Uh, Moritz Rubin was originally from Poland, but immigrated to Ohio and then came to Alexandria by 1870. He owned a restaurant in the 1870s, which became a saloon, but his furniture business was housed in this building. You can see M. Rubin and Sons and furniture on the front of the building. Uh, he passed away in 1893. His wife, Amelia, died in 1916. This picture is from 1924, and it shows that the business was later operated by his sons, Leopold and Daniel, and his daughter, Sarah. Uh, sadly, Daniel was severely injured in the store when he leaned into an elevator shaft to yell to some workers upstairs, but fell into the basement. He later died from those injuries. As you said, King Street, of course, has always been the heart of the business district in Alexandria, and so Jewish businesses certainly desired to be here. Uh, among the significant names in the Jewish community are those of Isaac and Henry Schwartz, natives of Bavaria. The brothers own and operate a store at 130 King Street, that's the old numbering system, currently around 518 to 520 King Street, uh, during and after the Civil War. And you can see the location depicted on this historic map from the 1870s, uh, with Isaac Schwartz's name near the center of the map. Now on the left in this photo is that building that the Schwartz brothers owned. Uh, this is in the federal style, which was popular in Alexandria at the time. And the building certainly seems to have been designed to house a commercial store on the first floor and residential quarters upstairs, uh, as does the building uh, on the right, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Now, Henry Schwartz may have partnered with Leopold Strauss as early as his arrival in 1855 to open a shop in this building. Uh, they didn't become owners until quite a bit later, however. Uh, Henry is also listed among the founders of Bethel in 1859. His brother Isaac arrived in 1860. Now, Isaac served in the 17th Virginia Infantry in the Confederate Army and was wounded in the Second Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas. 
Uh, Henry was an officer of the Hebrew Literary Society and was known for his, shall we say, creative style of advertisements. Here's one of our favorites. I've taken the liberty of typesetting the ad again on the right. I hope I was faithful to the original, even including the misspelling of the name in the second line. Uh, but we all get a kick out of that uh, sort of poetic style. Uh, this style, however, was not universally accepted. One critic appears to have referred to his as, as gallows humor. Uh, one or both brothers appear to have lived in that building uh, for uh, a fair time, both during and after the Civil War. Now, let's see, uh, other businesses near that location uh, included Lewis Barr's home right next door, and he had a dry goods store in that. Uh, in 1860, that was the site of the merged high holiday services that Bethel had with that unnamed Orthodox congregation I mentioned. Now, when Lewis Barr left Alexandria in 1862, the next renter of his home was David Bentheim. He appears to have been joined in Alexandria by his brother Leopold, who arrived via Baltimore shortly thereafter. They originated in Baden, Germany, uh, and are listed among the founders of Bethel Hebrew Congregation. So presumably by the time they rented the store, they had been there for a few years. David Bentheim, like the Schwartz brothers, operated a dry goods store, and it was said right next door. Uh, we have a listing in 1876 of his store at 112 King Street, as well as this one uh, we ta we're talking about at 132 King Street as his home and store in 1862. And he seems to have done sufficiently well for himself to have opened David Bentheim and Sons, a men's clothing business, seen here in the 400 block of King Street. Uh, this is, of course, during the 1922 snowstorm, which, you know, not something we get to see very often in Alexandria. Uh, now, unfortunately, all of these buildings that you see in this picture and in the previous picture were lost in urban renewal projects. Uh, David's daughter, Rachel, married Max Pretzfelter, a Bavarian immigrant, and Pretzfelter opened yet another dry goods store at his, what is now 528 to 530 King Street, uh, just a couple of doors down from David Bentheim's store. Uh, sadly, Rachel and Max saw three of their children pass away during the time of the store, which is 1882 to 1896. Other Bentheim descendants would rise to greater heights in Alexandria, however. So here I have a picture of Leopold Benheim at the upper left, and I'm showing the families of Leopold and his brother, David. But I wanna focus on Leopold and Caroline's youngest child, Charles, as he becomes quite significant in Alexandria politics. I've listed here the positions he held. The years listed are likely only a subset of his terms. These are the ones I can verify for each of those positions. And in truth, I'm not entirely sure that those all ranges really are continuous, but I know that the first and last years are correct. Now, Charles married Edith Schwartz, and I can't find the date of that marriage. The name, at least, probably rings a bell. I just mentioned she's the daughter of Isaac and Lena Schwartz, who had the business right next door. Uh, and the political dynasty of sorts would continue as Edith and Charles have a son, Leroy Bentheim. He's born in 1906 and begins his political career around the time of his father's passing. He ultimately became the second Jewish mayor of Alexandria as well as a state senator, encompassing a political career that lasted over 40 years. Interestingly, he served as mayor while he was president of Bethel Hebrew Congregation. That kind of begs the question, the first Jewish mayor of Alexandria, uh, that is Henry Strauss. Uh, Strauss was born in Germany, but came to Alexandria around the age of 12, we think. Uh, he spent some time in the state of Georgia, but returned to Alexandria, married Emma Weisberg in 1863. And he seems to be, have become a very successful businessman, owning multiple stores along King Street, and as you can see by the list here, active in Alexandria politics. Uh, upon his passing in October of 1910, the Alexandria Gazette reported, quote, Mr. Strauss's circle of acquaintances was probably larger than that of any other person in Alexandria, and his open, jovial good nature won him many friends. While of Jewish birth and holding to the faith of his fathers, he was peculiarly conservative in his religious views. In fact, his nearest friends and confidants were neither of his faith nor kin, and while he adhered to the system in which he had been born, he scorned the thought of unchurching anyone and firmly believed all struggling souls would eventually reach a better world, though they took different roads in their journey there too. Hence, he never failed to open his purse for the benefit of any denomination when an appeal was made to them, nor did anyone needing help apply to him in vain. He also served as a trustee of Bethel around the time he was mayor, or perhaps just after his term ended. We should also note one of Strauss's contemporaries, Isaac Eichberg. We mentioned him in connection with Bethel earlier, where he was president and apparently led services in the absence of a rabbi. But he was also active in German civic organizations and served on the Alexandria City Council, at least in 1880. Again, I don't know when his term began or ended. 
He owned a dry goods store on the northeast corner of King and Royal Streets, which is part of Market Square now. Uh, and at time, for a time, his store was managed by Henry Swartz. And the family business prospered well into the 20th century. His wife, Babette, gave birth to sons Louis and Rudolph. Other Jewish Alexandrians found success in business and were able to pass it down to the next generation. Joseph Brager founded a business in the 19th century, and you can see his name on this map at the far left, uh, which again from the 1870s, as part owner uh, or owner of part of the store at 72 Prince Street. Now, that same map also lists him as the owner of 12 King Street, which is between Lee and Union Streets. Uh, the 1876 Chatain's Directory lists those two addresses as clothing businesses, and he appears to have owned 55 King Street in 1860 as well. He originally specialized in oystermen's and fishermen's garments, which would certainly seem to be a promising business given Alexandria's founding and continued focus at that time as a port. Uh, the 1889 Chatain's Directory lists his business still at 108 King Street. That's the same building as 12 King Street, just in the new numbering system. And it appears that he became one of the wealthier members of the Jewish community. Now, he was originally from Prussia, he married a woman named Isabella, whose parents were Prussian, although she was born in Maryland. They had a daughter, Ida, in 1864. And by 1876, they had a 21 year old clerk at their Prince Street location. Uh, his name was Emmanuel Goldsmith. When Joseph Brager retired and then passed away in 1886, Emmanuel Goldsmith and Isabella Brager ran the business together, although it appears that they kept Joseph Brager's name on the business for some years afterward, at least through the city directory in 1889. And so if you go look at the building at 108 King Street, you will see the name of E. Goldsmith at the top of that building to this day. It's the Creamery and Ice Cream Shop. By 1907, Emmanuel Goldsmith owned the building at the southeast corner of King and Lee Streets, operating, according to the uh, Virginia Tercentennial Book for Alexandria, a, quote, large and extensive wholesale and retail business of, let's see, according to the facade, uh, shoes, boots, trunks, clothing, notions, more clothing, and hats. That building is still there today. Uh, the Dreyfus and Sons scrap business was located at this union, uh, the picture on the map here of Union and South, uh, South Union and Prince Streets. Simpson Dreyfus was again among the founders of Bethel and started his business also in 1859. His wife Caroline inherited it upon his death in 1861, and then son Julius took over. Uh, he also, we know, we know that Julius owned a home on South Payne Street as well as the business. Uh, Julius was known to travel far and wide to arrange for purchase and transport of waste materials for his business as far as Philadelphia, St. Louis, Georgia, even Havana. Uh, Julius also left the time behind meticulous notes. Uh, we have a to-do list for one day that includes ship cottonseed oil and kill goat. No word on the completion of those items. Uh, his notebook also served as a journal of sorts. Uh, one entry includes a scathing condemnation of the power of railroad monopolies, which apparently had cost him financially. Uh, Julius had 13 children from his first marriage and three from his second. Uh, some reports indicate that intermarriage was common among Alexandria's Jewish community in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as the community declined, and that several of Julius Dreyfus' daughters married non-Jews. Now, Julius had an older sister, Betty, and she has an interesting wedding story. She was engaged to Henry Baum of Washington, D.C. When it was clear the Civil War would not end quickly, President Lincoln issued a draft for the Union Army. Travel restrictions prevented eligible men from leaving their home states to avoid the draft. So because of these travel prohibitions, the groom could not travel to his bride's home in Alexandria as would have been the tradition back then. So the couple got married in Washington, DC. Their ketubah or wedding contract shown here from the Capitol Jewish Museum's archives gives the date of the wedding as November 6th, 1862. Julius's younger sister, Jeanette, married Samuel Bernheimer, whose family initially stayed with the Dreyfus family upon their arrival in Alexandria. It seems to be a bit of a theme here. Uh, Bernheimer is said to have emigrated Germany in 1865 or 1866, and the wedding took place in December of 1867. Uh, Bernheimer owned a store at 38 King Street, uh, which, according to the city directory in 1889, was listed as a harness maker and saddler. Now, Holland House is one of the better known homes in, in Old Town Alexandria and is on the uh, map of historical significance since 1969. According to Ruth, Ruth Lincoln Kay, the house appears to have been built around 1785, but the longest tenure as owner belongs to Leopold Gensberger, who is another name we have listed as a founder of Bethel Hebrew Congregation. 
Leopold owned a clothing store on Payne Street, sold boots and shoes at 116 King Street, and there's an Ellen Meyer Gensberger who operated a store, at, a cigar and tobacco store at 114 King Street, just down the road from Isaac Schwartz and so forth and so on. The 1870s map that you see here also shows Gensberger on King Street, just east of Lee, uh, the number isn't given, but it's between 30 and 38, uh, in the property known as Holland House, this top center. Uh, of course, that name comes later. Uh, and there's a decidedly smaller footprint for the house at that time. And with another property farther east on Wolf Street uh, between Lee and Union Streets. Now, Leopold passed away in 1901. His wife, Betty Meinberg Gensberger, passed away in 1905. Uh, but the daughters, Hannah and Amelia, continued to live in the house, uh, and a son, Segman, moved west. Another son, Simon, unfortunately passed away in 1898 at the age of 33. Now, Hannah passed away in 1921 and Amelia in 1956, but it's not clear to me how long each of them stayed in the house. But they did inherit enough money from their father and mother to live on, and they regularly made the society column in the papers. Uh, here you see one example from the Washington Post in 1913. I'll go ahead and read it because it's a little bit hard to see it. Uh, it says, Miss Amelia Gensberger and Miss Hannah Gensberger were given a delightful masquerade surprise party Tuesday evening at their home in Wool Street, that's Holland House, in honor of their house guest, Mrs. Saul Gensberger of Butte, Montana. We think that may be segment. Uh, among other guests was Mrs. Magnus B. Schreier of Cleveland, Ohio, who was the guest of her brother and brothers and sister-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Bendheim, and Mr. and Mrs. Louis Bendheim, again, a name we've heard before. Uh, so I'll end my comments there. He said, it obviously seems like it was a very close-knit community, and there's some very significant names that did very well for themselves, but we only have a few names really out of the numbers that seem to be there. But I'll go ahead and yield my last few minutes to Stephanie Fry, museum educator for the Capitol Jewish Museum. Hello, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and try to start my video. I think, Michelle, you might need to start it for me. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and start talking. So as Mark mentioned, I'm Stephanie, the museum educator at Capital Jewish Museum. There we go, hello. And I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about what you're seeing in front of you. This is a rendering of what the museum will look like when we are completely finished with construction. Currently, we are under construction. Um, in downtown Washington, D.C. at the corner of 3rd and F Street Northwest. If you've ever been to the National Building Museum, we're just a block away, an easy access via the Judiciary Square Metro stop. Um, being just 10 blocks from the U.S. Capitol and in the heart of D.C., we're using our location to set the context for our museum as we explore the intersection of American Jewish experience and American democracy using a local lens. Uh, Mark, if you could advance it. One thing I wanna talk about is, I just wanted to show this example because this relates to the stories that Mark was, show, was sharing tonight. This is an interactive map table in the core gallery, and it's going to allow visitors to dive deeper into information like what we've heard tonight. Um, you'll actually be able to zoom in and zoom out on the different chapters of history in DC and Maryland and Virginia as you explore these different Jewish stories. Um, so this is one sneak peek. And if we go to the next one, you'll see this is a sneak peek of the, of the cutout of the whole museum. So what we've done is we have a historic synagogue on that you can see in the left of the image. And that was the first synagogue built in Washington, DC for the purpose of being a synagogue. Um, as Mark mentioned, the congregations in Alexandria practiced in churches and so did the ones in DC. And then um, this is the and eventually converted churches into synagogues, but this was the first synagogue in the city that was built to be one. Um, and you can see that the bottom floor is our orientation gallery, but the top floor is the historic sanctuary that's been preserved. And so we're creating this really amazing um, immersive experience inside of it. You can also see pretty prominently on the right-hand side, that's our modern building that, we're, that will connect um, to the historic synagogue. And you can see there's a, a white square with an image of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's wearing a crown. That's our first special exhibit we're going to open with. And it's the Notorious RBG that was created by the Skirball Museum in Los Angeles. Um, and next slide. This is a video, so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't right away, and that's okay if it doesn't. Um, but Michelle can put the link for the Capitol Jewish Museum website in the chat and you'll be able to see the construction that has been happening lately. The building has literally been flying up over the past few months. Um, 
it's okay if it's, it's not working for me on my side, but sometimes that happens with these videos. It's all right. Um, so, but on our website is a constructions page where you can see, you could watch all these time lapse that we put together of the construction that's moving, been moving through. Um, our anticipated opening now is fall of 22, and I hope that we'll be able to see you in person and welcome you through our doors when that happens. So thanks, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark and um, for questions. So if you have any, please make sure you put them in the chat. Um, Michelle also added the, what, the email address. If you have questions about the museum, feel free to email us and myself or someone else on staff will get back to you. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie, for that. Um, that looks really exciting, exciting time for you guys. And thank you, Mark, for that informative lecture. Um, I loved some of those historical pictures on um, the old buildings. And I want to turn it over again. If you guys have questions, remember down at the bottom, um, I want to see. Um, uh, we do have one question. Do you know anything about Stephen Winsos or Browns? So I, I, I will I say my short answer is I do not recognize those names. Okay. Uh, so I am looking through one of our lists real quick and I don't see it on the list of residents in Alexandria around Jewish residents around the time of the Civil War. Um, if you have any uh, you know time frame we might be looking for that would help, but I, I don't recognize those names. Okay. Uh, maybe the person who asked can throw in a little bit more uh, information. Um, we have, uh, uh, thanks for an out outstanding informative presentation. Uh, this person took a walking tour led by you guys about a decade ago, but this was far more informative. So kudos to you guys. And so we, are, we are actively researching this tour. It is, we learn a lot every time we do it. Uh, and I see one other question here. Do I know the reason for the decline in the Jewish population in Alexandria? Uh, we can speculate on, but uh, no, I don't have a specific reason or I don't have like, you know, why did certain people leave? Uh, certainly uh, the period of reconstruction in the late 19th century was not good to Alexandria in general. Uh, you can see in the population figures, which normally I give those actually when I do the tour, I assume that this group would be a little more familiar with that. Um, but Alexandria is very stagnant overall. So I can only assume that what happened in the Jewish community was simply a reflection of what was happening to Alexandria as a whole. But I really, I don't have any evidence for, you know, in any particular case why somebody left. We know that we do know some people left. Uh, and I don't really know, like, you know, if there's a general reason. Right. Like, I know some went to Baltimore during the Civil War, and then <laughs> some of them came back and some of them didn't. Uh, but let's see. Oh, here we go. Hmm. Uh, Windsor was a Jewish jeweler on King Street, and Brown was a Jewish-owned clothing store on King Street. But again, I don't know the time. So yeah, I said I still that it doesn't doesn't ring a bell. But I will I will certainly go do a little bit of digging, and if I can find out anything, I will try to let everybody know. Great. Um, Let's see what else I see. Uh, there were Jews in Norfolk, Virginia, way back before the Revolution. Why Alexandria is so late? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, Alexandria, of course, was founded in 1749, right? So why does it take so long? We really don't have any any good evidence for why. I guess, uh, you know, we, we can speculate on all kinds of reasons. Um, you know, Alexandria, of course, was founded really because they wanted a port for shipping. Uh, I guess, you know, that did maybe didn't lead people to think there was much of a business opportunity. So if you're, you know, your experience in how to make a living is selling goods, then that may not have made Alexandria a very attractive target, certainly not as much as other East Coast cities would have been. But again, I'm, I'm really just speculating. Uh, so, and it's not that we, it's not that there were none. We can't definitively say there weren't, we just don't know of any. And certainly there didn't seem to be much of a community until the Civil War period. Okay. Um, would you like to talk about the other tours that you all offer? Um, is there anything else you'd like to present while you have the opportunity? Stephanie, do you want to? 
Um, sure, I think Michelle would have to start my video again, but I can chat. Um, we are currently, currently at the moment we are virtual. And so we have been hosting virtual walking tours of downtown Washington, DC. Um, and that's what our focus for the past year has been. We have a few, we had a virtual program today that we sponsored with the 1882 Foundation and the Chinese American Museum. Uh, in addition to this, we've been part of this today. And then we are, um, we have, we are preparing to start in-person tours this fall for small groups of 10 people. So if you're interested in that, you can definitely email us at info at capitaljewishmuseum.org. Michelle put that link in earlier, so it, the email address is there. Okay, well, thank you so much. And we do have a couple more. Um, was, it, was it exceptional that two Jewish Americans were poly, pol politically active in the South? I, I am probably not the best person to answer that. Uh, it doesn't strike me too much as exceptional that there seem to be quite a few stories. If you're talking about somebody like Judah Benjamin, that's, you know, that's obviously another level, but uh, that there were Jews who were politically active in Alexandria seems to be that it's more connected to, they were connected to the German community, which was very strong. And that seems to have been as much or more important of a connection than that they happen to be Jewish. Uh, and so there aren't a lot of Jews who are active in top politics. So you said there's only a couple that you know seem to be in that time period. Uh, and they seem to have been very involved in the, you know, the German civic communities uh, organizations as well. So it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know that it's, it's really exceptional. It may just reflect those two individuals more than it reflects anything about the community. Okay. And since it is ongoing, um, could you talk more about the research process? So the research process, for the, obviously the last year and a half or so, it has been largely me sitting here with Google. Uh, but um, no, we, uh, so Bethel has a, a nice history piece on their website that was a good source. Um, uh, obviously, I mentioned Ruth Lincoln Kay earlier, who you, know, you can't talk about a building in Alexandria without getting her take on it because she's obviously very significant. Um, there's a, uh, the author's name is escaping me. I want to say it's Ruth Sinberg Baker, who wrote a history of that block in King Street that housed the Schwartz store. So she has a nice long article that mentions a lot of the Jews, and there's a whole section in there on the Jewish uh, owners because it was a number of people. Um, and, you know, said other than that, it's just, you know, people who do sort of, you know, history of Alexandria, and they mentioned people that we know uh, were, were there and were part of the Jewish community. Uh, there is also something called the Chappelle Project out there who is trying to work on the uh, uh, Jews who were members of either the Union or Confederate Army. Uh, which is in reaction to a book by Simon Wolf, uh, where he tried to list them and he basically was just going by that name sounds Jewish, so I'll put them in the book. Uh, but they're trying to do uh, a more extensive research to verify. Uh, that obviously overlaps with a lot of the Southern life, you know, so a town like Alexandria, as I mentioned, Isaac Schwartz, for example, was in the Confederate Army. Um, so there's, you know, places where we can try to take a little bit more uh, research. And I see uh, Les is uh, helping uh, add to our, yes, that's true. I mean, said there were, you know, there were Jews who were, um, you know, politically active. Yes. Um, and uh, it does say the 500 block of King, including Schwartz lot was excavated in the 1970s. Right, and that's the article by Ruth Sinberg Baker is gonna cover that block. Okay. Um, was it hard to find pictures? Was, was there a source that was harder or easier to find, be it newspapers, photos, um, primary, you know, written? Uh, you know, it, we, it's, it's a real mix of things that have come to us from everywhere. I said a lot of it is just, I just do a search on the internet. I know once I get a name, I start looking for that particular name anywhere I can find it. Uh, as far as a lot of the pictures we got, I will actually, this one of the interesting stories, when we first did this tour, uh, we didn't know a lot. We had the name of Moritz Rubin, but we didn't know a lot about him. Uh, when we did a tour for the Alexandria Library, uh, they made a flyer on their own and they found a picture of his store. 
which we hadn't seen before. That's the picture I showed you. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, that got me thinking, well, let's take a look through their whole list of pictures of historic Alexandria. And so actually I made a very extensive list of things that we hope one day we can uh, borrow from the uh, Alexandria Library Special Collections. And actually the maps that I used were uh, essentially me taking photographs of the, uh, I guess it's the, uh, the Hopkins uh, 1870s insurance map, mm -hmm. which is what I was using. And um, we have another question. Um, to what extent to use experience anti Sorry, guys. Um, I mean, yeah, through the decades, um, did they um, experience? Uh, uh, so it's a good question. Um, as I said, my inclination is to say that it doesn't seem like it was extensive. Obviously, it didn't keep the Jews who were active politically from achieving political office. Again, it's, I, I read those stories because it's obviously known that they were Jewish. Uh, you know, when they were talking about the businesses on King Street, when they were talking about Henry, Henry Strauss. So it doesn't seem like it limited them. Uh, that certainly isn't to say that they didn't experience any anti-Semitism. I'm sure they did. Uh, but we don't have a lot of examples. Now, I will also point out that most of the people we talked about as individuals are German Jews, reflecting what was going on in Germany when they left, which was the beginning of what we would now call the reform movement. Again, that name doesn't come until a little later. Uh, but they were much more assimilated into the larger community than, for example, you notice none of the names I talked about were connected to Agudas Sachim in its early years. The Eastern European Jews tended to be uh, a little more insulated uh, and a little less assimilated and said more traditional in their approach to religion which mean they were separated off more. So you wouldn't likely see those, uh, the members of Agudas Achim in that time when they were an Orthodox congregation, for example, uh, having a high rate of intermarriage, which the German Jews did. Uh, so it doesn't seem like there's a lot of overt anti-Semitism. I can't say there's none. That would be shocking to me if there were none, but uh, we don't really have a lot of stories where there are specific examples of anti-Semitism so, which is, I think that's impressive on its own. Uh, there's another question here about Rabbi Frank. We actually do have quite a bit of uh, stories about Rabbi Frank. I, uh, because it's a little bit later on, I decided I would leave that out of the, uh, when we do the full hour and a half walking tour, we do talk about him. Uh, so Rabbi Emmett Frank was a rabbi of Bethel. Uh, somewhere in the 1950s, he was actually very outspoken against segregation and the various practices uh, associated with that. Uh, he was uh, quite fiery from the pulpit, and it, uh, it took quite a bit of, I would say, political maneuvering uh, to say that, well, you know, rabbis and other clergy in the area would ha should have freedom of speech from the pulpit, that they could talk freely about their views on things like segregation. And, uh, so uh, he was uh, quite fiery. Uh, it certainly drew condemnation. There's a picture in the Capitol Jewish Museum archives of his car being searched for a bomb um, because there was a bomb threat called in uh, when he was giving his speech. So it's certainly, that's uh, another part of the story. It comes a little later. And so that's why I decided to you know leave it out of this talk. But yes, we do tell it when we do the full walking tour. Someday we'll do that again. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you can come back and do the later, <laughs> later half. Um, do you guys, uh, I know it's not part of actual Old Town, but do you talk about Bethel, the move to Seminary Road or no, because it, again, it's not. Uh, so we don't have a lot of, other than the dates, I so said, I don't really have, again, they, we know that they, um, uh, so we know they were growing at that time, post-World War II. Um, but we don't have a lot more about it. I've, I think if we went back to Bethel's website, you probably would find quite a bit about that time period. Um, but we, when we wrote the tour, we we chose to focus on sort of the earlier part. Well, that, again, that I think that's great. <laughs> um, does anybody else want to throw in some questions in the chat? Or again, we're getting lots of thank yous. Um, again, this was very informative. Uh, I have to say personally, I, I took the walk several years ago um, and this was such a refresher and much more informative so I want to personally thank you. Um, I should also then mention uh, David McKenzie wrote a lot of the original tour material and my wife Dina Zolotowski also has been helping with the research and she's actually the historian not me so. Great. Um, 
Uh, okay, so we're getting Windsor was okay. a men's clothing store, not a jeweler. Okay. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do some research on that one. We have a more to do's. <laughs> You're gonna have a to do list before this is over. Good. <laughs> it's never finished. Um. Well, look. Um, I do hope that we get you do schedule another walk and as things open up. And I do want to thank you again. Um, and we have February 5th, 1865. They were perceived as vacant, um, have been filled by Jews. We regard this as a, rather a blessing and would most gladly see the balance of this class follow. That's, that's a great, I love that quote. Um, again, if nobody, okay. Ah, okay, I'm gonna go have to go back in the chat <laughs> when this is done really quickly because I can't take pictures and do this. But anyway, I do wanna thank you. And uh, I do wanna let people know our lecture for next month it's on Wednesday, June 23rd uh, at 7.30. And our topic's going to be a short history of Shooter's Hill and the construction of the George Washington Masonic Memorial. And our speaker is Mark Talbert, and he will be covering the history from the 1790s until 1910, when it largely became the property of the George Washington Masonic Memorial Association. And he's going to focus on the construction of the memorial between 1922 and 1932. And we hope you uh, register for that. And thank you so much for attending this evening and take care.